But let's open our Bibles to Acts 14. And you have come this morning, I don't know if you realize uh, that you have come to the gathering of the body, the local manifestation of the body of Jesus Christ, gathered here as his church at Calvary because he's drawing and prompting us to do so. We don't come to church because uh, we have to, because it's kind of on our calendar and we're supposed to, uh, because we got some kind of invitation. We come as believers because we are drawn from within that we want to come where Jesus Christ walks among us as his gathered church. But not only that, we come because his word is what we want to focus on. One of the, the hallmarks of the early church was that they gathered for the word of God to be taught to them. Before it was written down, uh, they would, would hear the, the speaking from the apostles and from the prophets. And after it was written down, they would have it read to them as the letters came to the churches. And it was only after quite a while that actually people had their own copies that they could carry around and tote with them like we do. And now it's in so many different forms that it's hard to believe. But we have come as, as a succession of all the generations of the Church of Christ to worship him, focus on him, and listen to the Lord speak to us through his word. And I hope that, that you have a heart to listen and to respond this morning. Because what I want to talk about, you see it on the screen there. I've always wondered what you see. Because it's not on my screen. All it says there is exit, and I don't want to do that. So, uh, but uh, this morning I'm talking about the gospel. And, and as I'm talking about the gospel, we're continuing through the book of Acts, and you're in chapter 14. That's how far we've gotten. We're looking at the 22 gospel presentations, descriptions, definitions, and also the, the techniques that they use to communicate the truth. We're looking at those 22. But as we're going through those, what we're coming to this morning is how supernatural the gospel is. And that's why I titled this, What Was the Gospel? And by the time we get to chapter 17, that's where we're headed this morning is chapter 17. It's described there by unsaved people, by pagans, by lost people, people that weren't converted. They said those people that have turned the whole world upside down have come here too. Do you understand? That's how lost people thought the gospel was presented as a world, a paradigm tumble. That everything formerly that was important changes. That everything formerly that, that was the direction of the life has been upturned. It's kind of like an earthquake and a tsunami all put together. And that's how the gospel was defined. Now let me ask you this. Has that happened to you? Or... Do not even remember something happened to you. Everyone told you something happened to you or everyone assures you it's happened to you. In fact, uh, last week one of our, our pastors uh, had, had just a phone and appointment with someone they never met and they came in and the person wanted to talk to someone and they said, what can we talk about? And the person told them and, and of course the first thing we always do is we ask them if they've ever heard the gospel and they said, well, I don't need to hear the gospel because I've always been told I'm worthy of heaven. And, and they just went right through that and, and the pastor said to them, Did you, would it shock you if you knew that that's not what the Bible says? And the short of it is that they were led to the Lord and have become a follower of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the gospel is powerful. The gospel that is taught in the word of God totally changes people from the inside out. In fact, it traumatizes. That's what we're going to look at this morning. It traumatizes people that hear the gospel and don't respond to it because they see their friends change. But let's look at that this morning. Salvation is a miracle from God. Salvation is the most amazing miracle we get to see up close through our lives as believers. First, we get to see it inside of us. In fact, the Bible says that the greatest proof of God is when he moves in and changes us. We become a new creation in Christ. Now again, let me ask you, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have hope for my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Has that happened to you? Or do you just attend church? See, it's a miracle. It's a miracle I can't perform. You can't come up here and I go, you're saved. I mean, it's amazing how people think that if they get to the right place and you're the right person and if they say the right words that something will happen to them. God saves people 
and only God saves, and it's a miracle when he does. But you know what the joy is? We get to be right up close. You know, when people hear about miracles, I mean, there used to be these traveling tent healing services that, that crisscrossed the United States, especially in 20s, 30s, and 40s, and even into the 50s, and people were drawn. There used to be standing room only. They came to see a miracle, and now they can watch it on TV. But you know what? You want, want a real miracle? Get saved. You talk about a verification of God. When you connect with him, it's unbelievably powerful. Well, that was the reality of salvation, that we're even saved in itself as a miracle of God's grace. And those who are around us are saved are a part of the constant stream of miracles we get to see and touch personally through life. That's why coming to church. We come to see lives God has changed. And it stimulates and encourages and helps us. And, and it, it makes us remember again what God has done to us. In fact, when we get to disciple people, when we get to, to disciple someone who is miraculously saved, is such an encouragement to us. Now, what is the miracle of salvation? Well, let me just describe it from God's perspective, okay? If you just took together how God looks at us, this is what the Bible says. From God's perspective, all of us humans were born into this world infected with a blinding, crippling virus. We had it at birth, we got it, and left alone with no intervention from God, it leads to eternal death and darkness and endless pain. Every single human being ever born on this planet has had this infection except for one. And he wasn't a normal human. He was God in human flesh, born in the normal way of humans except God miraculously conceived him within Mary so that he did not have the sin virus. But other than that, every single one of the billions born are born with this virus that more and more cripples and blinds them through life. You say, what do you mean by crippled? We are slaves at birth to the God of this world. Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day, you're of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. The reason that, that, that kid shot up Seattle, Pacific University, whatever yesterday or the day before is, because he's following his father the devil, who was a murderer from the beginning, and doesn't abide in the truth. See, that's what the Bible says is all of our fate. And it cripples us, blinds us, but it gets worse when you think about it. God looks down and sees us sitting blinded in the dark, but we're at the edge of a deadly chasm. We're ready to fall into this endless, conscious, painful torment of dying with our sins. And God sees us as we're sitting there on the edge of that. And salvation is when he opens our eyes, when he turns us from sinful darkness to lovers of God. Do you understand? We were born loving the darkness rather than light. Jesus said that. When we're saved, we love the light rather than the darkness, and we want to love and follow God rather than the God of this world. Now, everyone was born blind and paralyzed, a, a lover of darkness. And at a point in our life when we call out in faith to the only one that can save us, when we call to him and say, you're right, I'm paralyzed, sinful, wicked, hopeless, sitting on the edge of the chasm ready to fall into endless destruction, and I ask you to save me. Now you notice I didn't say, I didn't say a formula. There isn't a specific order of words that you say and have someone nearby intoning and doing motions or something. It is completely connecting to God. And by the way, we saw last time, last Sunday, that God is only one arm's length away from everybody on this planet. You talk about access. I mean, God is this close, one arm's length from everybody. He's standing that close to everybody. He says, if happily you'll grope and in your blindness and paralysis, if you'll just try and get to him. He says, I'm right there. And salvation is when we call out to the one who's been there all the time and ask him to save us. Well, when that happens, it traumatizes 
unsaved people around us that it doesn't happen to. And that's what we're going to see in the book of Acts. When the light of the gospel shines into the hearts and minds of the blind and paralyzed lost sinners, they come alive. They were sitting right on the edge of the cliff. They were just almost toppling into it. And all of a sudden, their eyes are open. They go, <gasps> and they don't want anything to do with that. And they just start getting as far away from the edge as possible. And all the other people sitting on the edge is going, what's wrong? Where are you going? What happened? What happened? You're just different. What are you doing? And you and I start telling them, you're you're a sinner. You're, you're blind. You're paralyzed by your sin. You're headed to destruction. God, the maker of heaven and earth, has moved in. And they go, you're crazy. Sit down and be quiet and come on back. You know? And that's the trauma. And that's what the whole book of Acts is about, if you think about it. The unsettling, shocking condition that all the blind and paralyzed sinners around them, that we cause them when we get saved. When we all of a sudden start with our eyes are open, we can see they can't. They think we're crazy. And they don't want anything to do with it. It's so unsettling. You know, we can see this most clearly in Christ's ministry. At the perfect moment, God himself stepped into time and space. He became a man, Jesus Christ, God the Son. And, and he lived this super powerful life among humans. Think of everything Jesus did in the Gospels. He came as the light of the world. He healed, raised, fed, liberated, cleansed, and calmed multitudes of people. I mean, if, if people just got near him, the power of God was there, and he healed them. And when they were hungry and out in the wilderness, he fed all of them. And when they were on their way to the graveyard with their wi widows, with their only sons being carried in a casket, he'd stop the casket and he'd touch it and the person would come to life. I mean, you talk about an, an explosion of light and life and power. And what was the result? You know, you've read the chapters. This astounding event of Christ's love and power flooding the land of Israel was so unsettling to the spiritually blind and paralyzed leaders that they did everything they could to end Christ's work. Do you remember what they did? They murdered the Prince of Life. See, that's how traumatic the gospel is. When people started being turned from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, the people around them get unsettled and traumatized. And the account of the book of Acts, all those mobs and the, the, the crowds beating and tearing and trying to pull Paul apart and, and all the beatings and the imprisonments and the stonings and everything else, why? Don't they have something better to do? It's because he rocked their boat and was tipping over their world, traumatizing them. Well, why, why do we do this trauma to the world? Well, in the end, after his resurrection, Jesus Christ met with about 500 people, which was probably the bulk of the true converts from his ministry. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus himself, after three and a half years of preaching and raising the dead and blind and lame and everything else, only about 500 people responded to him. And he met with the bulk of all those converts. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, he showed himself to them. But you know what he told them? He says, you're to continue the spread of the light of my gospel, the gospel of Christ, which began in Israel, but I want you to take it to every corner of this sin-darkened world. That's what we call the Great Commission. Great because it came from God. Mission because it's something we're supposed to do. Co-mission because we do it with him. See, we can't save people. We can't, Marek, I cannot turn someone from, from being totally enslaved to alcohol or to drugs or to immorality or to fear or to bitterness. I can't undo that. But I know who can. And I can introduce them to the one that can do that. And that's what the Great Commission is. It's not in, in our power. It's in his power unleashed through us. It's the most amazing thing. At this end of the spectrum of the scriptures after having seen the gospels now that are written down. Think about Jesus Christ, God the Son, commissioning those who were his followers. They were to go in his power and to do something. Now, I wrote it down for you to, to see what he commissioned them to do. They were all to go in his power and seek to share the life-transforming, sin-removing, blindness-ending gospel of salvation to every person in the world. 
That means they were supposed to go up to all those people sitting on the edge of the precipice, ready to tumble into eternal darkness, blindly paralyzed by their sin, and say, you don't have to. You don't have to be bound by your sin. You don't have to be blind. You don't have to be sitting in darkness. Let me point you to the one, and if you will cry out to him, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And, you know, we can say that to every single person. The gospel is intended for presentation to every creature. We don't have to go, well, I don't know if they'll respond, or I don't think they will respond, or I don't know if they're one of the elect. Who knows who the elect are? God does. Do you know how we find out? We share the gospel with them, and they just, they just explode with life. All we're supposed to do is share that gospel, the Great Commission. From that mountain in Galilee, Christ launched the gospel, and he promised to be going out with everyone who will take his message and share it. And he said, I will accompany you, I will empower you in this mission. And that's what we've been studying in the book of Acts. You're in chapter 14. You know how we got to 14? We covered the four gospel presentations Peter gave. It was Peter, 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 Peter. And then by the time we get to chapter 8, it's Peter and Philip. And then a little bit later in chapter 8, it was Philip all by himself. And then by the time we get to chapter 9, Jesus leads the apostle Paul to faith. And then by the time we get to chapter 11, multitudes of people are taking the gospel out. But this morning, we're looking at the reality that the gospel is now going global in the book of Acts. In chapter 14, we're looking at the end of the first missionary journey. It starts in chapter 13 and verse 4, and it ends in chapter 14 and verse 27. And it's Paul's, you all remember learning that in Sunday school, right? It's Paul's first missionary journey. And what we're looking at is what happens. Starting in verse 15, we're going to pick up in just a moment. You're there. We're going to read it in just a second. We're going to look at this gospel that was miraculous, that utterly turned the world upside down of everyone it touched with the transforming power of Christ in them. And Paul is testifying of this. Actually, the context of what we're reading is Paul's come back to his home church, Antioch, the ones that nurtured him, and he was discipled and encouraged by Barnabas, and, and then he was sent out with Barnabas on this first trip in chapter 13. And now... They've come home. And that's what verse 27 is. He's in front of the church telling them what God did. And that's going to be a blessing. We're just going to read three verses of it. So with that in mind, turn with me to chapter 14, verse 15. This is, if you're counting, this is the 11th gospel explanation presentation in the book of Acts. And with your Bibles open, let's stand up, and we're going to read three verses. You just follow along. I'm going to read them, starting in verse 15, then move down to verse 21, then move down to verse 27, and don't be alarmed. I'm going to go through all the words in between, but I don't want you to stand so long, okay? So I'm just showing you the highlights. We're just hitting the, the top. So those three verses, starting in verse 15. And saying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you. And preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God. Who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them. Now skip down to verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city... And made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Now to verse 27. Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them. And that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Wow. The first report of the World turning upside down, miraculous spread of the gospel global. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, there's so much just in these verses. How I pray they wouldn't just be words, that we wouldn't be so distracted that our minds are already on whatever is coming next in this day, but that we would ask you to focus our hearts, that we might see wonderful truth, that you would open our eyes so that with the eyes of our understanding, the spiritual new creations that we are, that we would hear you. And Father, I always pray for some, and 
they don't even know what we're talking about. This, this has never happened to them. They just go to church and they were just baptized and they're just a part of an organization, but they are not alive yet. I pray that even this morning, sitting here or watching on the stream, that you would stir and convict and draw them and may they cry out to you right where they're sitting and say, God, I'm, I'm paralyzed, I'm blind, I want to see, I want you to set me free, I want you, oh God, I want you to save me. You're here and you're an arm's length away. And what a blessing it would be if you did that miracle again and again and again all around us today. Be at work, we pray. Open our hearts as your children who know you to understand and obey. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. And you may be seated. Now let's go through this. With your Bibles open, start in verse 15. This is a profound part of Scripture. Now, the backdrop, I mean, I don't want to, I could read a lot more verses. Basically, Paul's come into town, healed this crippled guy. Everyone thought, wow, the gods have come to our town. And they got so excited that they haul out an ox and they're going to start sacrificing it to Paul and Barnabas. That's the short of this. And so right in the middle of that, they cry out in verse 15 and say, men, why are you doing these things? Don't sacrifice to us. We're also men. We're not Zeus and, and uh, you know, Mercury. We're not these gods. We're not here as, as uh, part of the Roman pantheon. We have the same nature as you. And here's what we came for. We preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God. Now, what's that mean in context? They were talking, I mean, they were talking about the temple to Zeus. Now, have you ever seen a temple to Zeus? I usually, in the Holy Land, there, there's a marvelous temple to Zeus in a city called Betshean. That's where uh, Scythopolis, it's also called. It's in the north. It's just south of the Sea of Galilee. And it's one of the largest excavations in the Holy Land. And, and it's, a, it's a Roman city that was destroyed by an earthquake in the 700s, the 8th century. It fell down. And so it's just, just like it was. And it got covered with dirt. And they pulled the dirt back, just acres of dirt. And you can come to the very heart of the main north and south and the main east and west road and right at that road I always pause with the group and, and you can see these 60 foot columns they're just like toothpicks falling down from they're just laying there still and I say imagine those columns 60 feet up on that platform the platform is 20 feet up and then put a 60 foot column and then put all the capital on top of that and this ornate structure this thing was taller than a 10 story building and, and that's what a temple of Zeus looked like. And here's Paul standing outside a temple of Zeus, 10 stories high, with all the people screaming and yelling that are followers and adherents and members of the Zeus club. And look what he says to them in verse 15. That you should turn from these useless things, this Zeus stuff, to serve the living God. You're doing useless activity here. This is not real. This is just a false pagan god. I mean, he really laid it on to them. You know, someone told me um, this week, they said, boy, you really hammered baptism last week. I said, yeah, they taught me in seminary. You hammer it once, you don't come back. The, the people that you don't like are the ones that hammer the same thing every week, not me. I hammer something different every week, you know? I say enough every week to offend someone or everyone, you know what I mean? But you don't hammer it every week. You just hammer it once and let it go. Well, Paul hammered everything about their life. Their whole life was built around. They put this temple front and center and everything rotated around it. And Paul says in verse 15, this, this is useless. You should come to the living God. Look at the rest of, of what it says in verse 15. He made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all the things that are in them. He's the creator. Verse 16, in bygone generations, he allowed nations to walk in their own ways. Now he, but now he, nevertheless, he does not leave himself without witness in that he did good. He gave rain from heaven. And what he's talking about is the, the kindness of God, that, that his evidence, the, the hand of God is seen in creation around them. And look at verse 18. And with these sayings, he scarcely restrained the multitude from sacrificing to them. Okay. So Paul preaches the gospel the people get all excited. Paul restrains them from sacrificing to them. Now look at verse 19. The Jews from Antioch and Iconium came over there and they persuade the multitudes 
and they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now that is kind of a tame line. That would be like on August 6th, Hiroshima was bombed. Have you ever seen what Hiroshima looked like after, or Nagasaki, which one was on the 6th, Nagasaki or Hiroshima? I don't know. But that doesn't carry the carnage and the destruction and the horror on the ground. Do you know what stoning was like? The Mishnah says, the Mishnah is the explanation of the Torah, which is the Old Testament. To stone someone, you had to find a hill that was about six feet high. And you got the person, and often it helped if you tied their hands, usually behind their back, and you get them right to the edge, and then you tip them over the hill. And they would fall down, and hopefully they would break their neck. That was, you know, it was kind of trying to be kind. You're killing them, okay? But you're trying to do it as nice as possible. And, and so you tip them over the hill and they fall and break their neck. But to make sure they're dead, everyone carries as big a rock as you can carry. And so you look around and, and you know, most men probably could hold about a bowling ball sized rock. And there with the sprawled, paralyzed, broken neck person, you would crush them to death with your rock. Do you see why it's, that's, the verse is tame. Paul Whatever they did to him, tied or not, tipped him over the hill or not, they knew how to kill people back then. And they threw rocks, hoping. I mean, what you do is if you're trying to get them out of their, mur- out of their misery, you go for the head. You know, and, and here's this crowd of people throwing bowling ball-sized rocks. And, and if they missed his head, the throat, the, you know what I mean? It's just crushing them. That's horrible. That's trauma. What would have driven them to that? Because Paul said, your temple's nothing. Your God is nothing. You're wasting your life. Don't do all that stuff. And, and they got agitated to say, he's destroying everything. He's, he's messing up our world. They were traumatized, and they took it out on Paul. But look what happens. This is what's so fascinating. They dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Verse 20, however, when the disciples gathered around him, so the disciples... The people who had followed Christ had had a miraculous salvation. They come to the garbage dump where they'd thrown the, the body of Paul. They were sure he was dead, and they were all standing there. And I don't think anybody knew what was going to They were just all sad. Can you imagine going to a, you know, a calling hours, a wake for a funeral, and stand around your beloved like this, and all of a sudden they sit up? That's what happened. Look what it says. It says they stood around him, gathered around him, verse 20, and he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached, verse 21, the gospel in that city, did you notice what happens? He doesn't retire. I mean, that would have been enough to have been on the circuit in the United States for the rest of your life. You could have gone around and and talked about how I got stoned and killed for Christ. And he would have just been billboard in every church. He keeps going. Undaunted. Because he was called not to make a name for himself, not to get glory, but to point people to Christ. I mean, that to me is one of the most astounding things in the whole book of Acts, that Paul went to the next city and preached the gospel to that city. And look what it says in in verse 21, and made many disciples. Do you see when you preach the gospel and people respond to the gospel, they become disciples? You understand? That's how we started this series. That is the most frequent description. He preached the gospel, people responded to Christ and became Christ's followers. They became disciples. And they returned, look what it says the next word, to Lystra. That's, that's where he got stoned. Can you imagine the looks on the rabble rousers and all gathered around the temple of Zeus when Paul walks by? And, and can you imagine the power of the gospel as these people are seeing God at work? That's why it turned the world upside down back then. And verse 22, they strengthened the souls of the disciples. They exhorted them to continue in the faith. And they said, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. I guess so, Paul. Can you imagine? He said, I bear in my body. You know what the Lord did? He brought him back to life. He didn't heal all the scars and everything. Paul was, was a collection of the result of all this mistreatment he got. He says, my body. I, I mean, he had on, on his back all those stripes from being uh, you know, beaten with rods. And, and he now had all the scars of being crushed and everything else. I mean, he must have been a sight. But he says, you know what? You should realize that through many tribulations, verse 22, we're going to enter the kingdom of God. Enter the kingdom of God? 
Did you know that seven times in the book of Acts that describes salvation? You're entering a new kingdom. You're going from the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the God of this world, the kingdom of sin and, and darkness loving into a new kingdom where you and I receive forgiveness of sins. We're set free from the power of the devil. Our eyes are open. We love the light. We're drawn to the light. We follow the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Wow. The kingdom of God. Look at verse 23. And when they had appointed elders in every church, by the way, every church had a plurality of elders from the start. There were never low, solo elders. There were always plurality. He appointed elders, plural, in every church. And prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. And so Paul did not have to be there and micromanage. He just left them. Those men of God commissioned and, and everything to lead and protect and to feed that church. And they passed through, verse 24, Pisidia went down to Pamphylia. They preached the word in Perga. Then they went down to Atalia. And then they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work. This is the home church where they came from. Now we're in verse 26, which they had completed. They had been sent out. The church prayed for them and supported them. They went out and did it. Then they come back to tell them what they did. That's why we have reports. It's very biblical following this pattern. But look what it says. This is what gets me. Verse 27. They gathered the church together and they reported all that God had done with them. Now yesterday, we, you know, we had a terrible thing happen. Our swisher mower died. That's the big 48 or whatever it is, you know, to mow all that gigantic mower. And so we well, not me, my boys, had to push Mo, uh, you know, and it took hours and hours. And I was watching them out there sweating, and so I said, I'm going to help. So I took the edger. That's why I got all sunburned, because I haven't done that in so long. It was very exciting. So I walked out into the garage where the edger is, and it just was standing there forlornly in the corner like this. It was kind of leaking a little oil and gas, and it was all dirty and dust on it and everything and I took that thing and I turned it over and checked and filled it up and everything and put the buttons like that and that thing in my hands just blasted away I mean I had more fun that's why they keep me away from the edge or I edge everything I just love it and uh, I even found you can do half inch sticks with it just cut them off you know and I did trimming the hedges with it you should have seen me I was squaring it off you just can turn that thing every direction of course I can hardly move today and you know what when I got all done I took it and set it back in the corner, and it's still there like this. Did you know, apart from me, the edger can do nothing. Now look back at this verse. I want you to think about it. Verse 27, now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported the incredible stuff they did. Mm -mm. Paul said, I'm just an edger. And I surrendered to God. And he turned me around and filled me up with what I needed and started me. And he held me and he cut a huge path through the darkness of paganism. Look at the words. All that God had done with them. You know what he was saying? You're all edgers. And God, if you'll just allow him to, wants to open you up and fill you full and seal you and energize you and holding you will do things you could never imagine from where you normally sit and lean in the corner lifeless god did all that and god got the credit and the church got all excited by the way the people from antioch were going everywhere that's where did you know in all the world this is where people are first called christians right here at this church i mean everybody wanted to be an edger in god's hands and they were just going throughout all of roman culture but he doesn't stop there and he opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. See what salvation is? Turning to God. That's what Paul preached to him. And when, when God gets involved, God opens the door of faith. When those people hear the glorious gospel and the Lord convicts them and the Lord shows them their sin and the Lord begins the, the work of drawing them, when they seek him, he opens the door of faith. Wow. Everyone got excited about it. So the Antioch report, by the way, prompts something. Look at chapter 15, and we're going to go to the next presentation. The traumatic impact of the gospel on the pagan culture that Paul just did, 
you know, telling them about it, leads us to this next, starting in verse 9. What the Lord does is, the, the home church, now see this is Antioch. Antioch is not Jerusalem. Antioch is a pagan city in the Roman Empire. Word from Antioch got all the way back to the, the people that were in Jerusalem. And look what it says in verse 7 of chapter 15. And there was much dispute going on. Do you know what was happening? The mother church didn't understand the home church in Jerusalem. What was going on out there in the territories with those pagans turning to God? And, and everybody in Jerusalem was all caught up with, are they eating bacon? Are they circumcising their kids? Do they all go to synagogue on Saturday? See, they were all into the Mosaic law back home. And, and it just kind of, you know, that's, did you know that's what happens when you're not involved in outreach? You get all you get all kind of uh, traditional and want everything comfortable. In fact, I was telling the elders and deacons on Thursday night that uh, when I was teaching through the chapter, I says, I remember when we many years ago came to Tulsa. Tulsa was a wonderful church. It was about 200 and some people, and and the median income of the church was probably 100 and something thousand dollars. And it was, in fact, people outside the church called it the the Tulsa Bible Country Club because it was just all professionals. I mean, they, everybody, talk about white collar. I mean, it was starched white collar. It was wonderful. Everybody knew each other. It was just wonderful. And then when people started getting saved and you had to sit next to with your $700 suit on, you had to sit next to someone that smelled like gas from a gas station or smelled like sweat, or worse than that, you know, smelled like smoke, you know. Oh. Now, it, it was shocking to them. And, and it took a while for them to realize that the church could not stay comfortably as a country club. That they had to have sick and, and handicapped and people in recovery from all these things. Did you know that's what the Jerusalem church was going through? And they were saying, oh man, you know, and there was a big dispute whether they're really Christians. And so what happens is, Paul gives, and Peter and James joins him in 15, verses 7 through 9, and then down in verses 19 and 20, Paul said this, and, and, and Peter and James affirm it. He says, true Christians are those who turn to God away from what offends him, but they turn to God and begin to follow him. And it's a supernatural work. And so watch this progress as, as, as Peter and James and Paul get together. And when there had been much dispute, that's verse 7, Peter rose up and he said, Men and brethren, you know a good while ago God, went among, uh, or God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now that is chapter 10. We're five chapters later. He's saying, don't you guys remember? Don't you remember I got invited? I was in Joppa, and I got invited to go to Caesarea, which no good Jew should go to because they're all pagans there. And to get me ready, I was up waiting for lunch, and I was hungry, and I had this vision. And these sheets came down from God, and they were filled with unclean creatures. And I said, Lord, I won't touch any of that unclean stuff. And the Lord says, don't call unclean what I have cleansed. And it was making Peter realize that you didn't have to be a good Mosaic law observant Jew to get saved. So he says, do you remember all that? How that by my hand the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe? Now look at verse 8. God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving to them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. Do you see why the, the gift of the Holy Spirit and them being signified of that at the, at the uh, chapter 10 event with Cornelius and his family? So notice the description of salvation. Hear the word of God and believe, verse 7. Give them the Holy Spirit, verse 8. Now look at verse 9. And made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. He said, those idol-worshiping pagans eating pork and everything else they do, they heard the same gospel and believed, they got the same spirit, and God, who does the miracle of salvation, purified their hearts. He said, they're saved. Now keep reading down to verse 19. Therefore I judge we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. See, salvation is turning to God. I was born of my father the devil, and the lust of my father I will do. Salvation turns me 
from the God of this world to the true and living God. So they are, verse 19, turning to God, verse 20, but we write to them, and, and this is, now this is fascinating. Abstain from things, and he gives this list. Look at the rest of verse 20. Polluted by idols, sexual immorality, things strangled and from blood. He says, abstain from things that offend God. Now, that list is very interesting if you look at it. I mean, it's clear idols are bad. It's clear sexual immorality is bad. What is things strangled and blood? I mean, when's the last time you heard a story, or I mean a message at church from the Bible about not eating any strangled food? I mean, a week ago, I was up visiting my son. I was in Boston. I went to the Whole Food Market. I've never shopped in a Whole Food. I mean, it's a national chain. I don't get out much. But I was in this Whole Food Market, and I was standing there with Bonnie, and I said, Honey, look. I said, The meat all has numbered it's got a code. I mean, I love codes. And so I saw that. And then on the wall, they had this list. One, two, three, four, five, five plus. I was all excited. I says, wow, let's look at the meat. And so I saw one. So I went over and one says, not crowded in pens. So I thought, that dead chicken wasn't crowded in a pen. Good. I mean, so I went back and I found a two. And it said, has access to the outdoors. Another dead chicken that used to have a door somewhere. It could go outside. It was getting exciting. I was digging through the meat. I found a three. Comfortable environment. I mean, so chickens talk about, yeah, it's a little hot in here, you know. I, I need, you know, and fresh water. I mean, and it, it gets worse. I, there's a five, and that means that, that they just could go freely wherever they wanted, eat anything they wanted, out in the sunlight with fresh air, fresh water. N you know, there was a five plus. There's one above five. I noticed that all the packages were empty. They didn't even kill those. They got to live forever. You know, I mean, you know, they're still out wandering somewhere. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, I believe in cons conservation and nature is important and you shouldn't litter and you shouldn't pollute and you shouldn't waste. I mean, God is into all that. But rating how much free time the pig got? <laughs> I mean, did you know you can go to jail today? If you go and harm an animal and someone gets a clip of you doing it, you will go to jail for sure no matter how good a lawyer you have. They'll play that over on YouTube until you're in jail or they'll hound you there. But you can murder someone on the streets of any town in America and probably get 17 months or less. And they'll let you out. Oh, everything. You talk about a world needing to be turned right side up. Ours is upside down. Animals are more important than people. Unbelievable. Well, all this to say, uh, there was a dietary law of the Jews. Look at verse 20. And the Jews, kosher means that you drain the blood out, you don't strangle them, you slit the throat. Let, that's what kosher is, kashar. It's done properly. Now, we're not under all those dietary laws, but what, what was the council saying? Don't intentionally offend people. Do you know who the weaker brother is in the scripture? The weaker brother has more rules in their life. And, and they can be easily offended. If they think something's wrong, we're not supposed to flaunt that in Christ we have liberty in that area. Now, just as an example, did you know, you have probably not even noticed this, but I don't tell stories about buying coffee on Sunday at Starbucks anymore. Do you know why? I walked out from first service and someone stopped right in the aisle. Looked, I mean, they just filled the aisle. They looked at me and they said, it is wrong for you to buy coffee on the Lord's Day. I said, but I shared the gospel. They said, it's still wrong. I don't tell stories about Starbucks anymore. I still go, I just don't tell you. Uh, and so, see, look what this is. Don't intentionally offend people. Don't go around and say, I'm drinking the blood from my strangled cow. And knowing that the Jews would cringe at that. See, what, what they're saying is, turn away from anything that offends God. God says, it offends me if you unnecessarily offend a new believer and make them go against their conscience. It wounds them. But the emphasis is turning to God. Well, real quickly, look at chapter 16. We covered this a little bit last week, but God opens hearts so that they heed his word. And this is the 13th gospel presentation. The Apostle Paul is giving it. 
And it's, it's starting in verse 14. A certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, which is a lot of information right there. She was in the top 1% of 1%. She was really a merchant of purple. That was one of the most costly commodities of the ancient world. And uh, she was from Thyatira. That's in Revelation, you know, one of those seven churches. She worshiped God. Now look at this. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Now you understand, Paul preached, the Lord opened her heart, and she responded. Now you ever wanted to balance Calvinism and Arminianism and all the other, you know, it just gets all confusing? Preach the gospel, God opens the heart, and the people that get saved respond to the gospel. And it doesn't explain the mechanics behind it. But right there it is. There is the gospel. We're supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel. I meet someone and they say, you can't tell everybody sitting on the edge that they're falling in that God wants to save them. I said, we're supposed to. Go to every creature and say, God wants to save you. So that's the preaching of the gospel. The ones that God is at work in, he opens their heart. And all of a sudden they start listening and then they respond and come to life. That's the miracle of salvation. And it's right here. Lydia, she responded, and she was responded and heeded the things spoken by Paul, verse 14, after the Lord opened her heart, in verse 15. And when that happened, she and her household were baptized, and she begged us and said, if you have judged me to be faithful in the Lord, come, and she persuaded us. Now, it's time to go. But this is where we're going to pick up next week. Have you ever wondered... What Paul taught, we need to pause for a moment and see what it is Paul taught about this event that took place in their lives. When, when this woman heard the gospel, the Lord opened her heart and she responded, what happened between there and baptism? What was it Paul told her and her family happened to her? That's fascinating to think about. We need to think about when Lydia believed and others in her family believed, the scriptures say they were baptized. Have you ever wondered what Paul told them about baptism? What did baptism mean to Paul when he administered it? What did Paul tell them happened to them when they got saved? Do you know why that's so important? Because we have a lot of people nowadays that don't seem to be miraculously saved. And maybe we need to tell them this is what God does. And if you're saved, these things will be present in your life. It's just like someone that buys a car and they're sitting there in their car, it doesn't move, and someone says, where are your tires? And they go, what are tires? I got this car without tires. And they go, where's the engine? They left the lid, there's no engine. I mean, they think they have a car, they don't. And everybody knows you need the engine and the tires. And da -da 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 -da. Yet we have a lot of people that are sitting in their little, and it's not going anywhere. Their Christian life is going nowhere. And you say to them, where are your tires? They said, what are tires? You go, where's your engine? The Holy Spirit. They go, you understand, Paul explained to them what real salvation was. And then he baptized them. It's a miracle. And if it happens, it takes us from being a little edger sitting in the garage to being opened, filled, energized, and in the hands of God. Doing stuff we could never do. That's salvation. Let's stand for a word of prayer. And as you stand, we are going to pray, but at the end of the service, there are always elders and godly women here, and they have their Bibles. And here I'll tell you why they're here. If you this morning were sitting out there, and, and as you were tracking through, you're saying, God, this hasn't happened to me. I ask you today to save me. If you did that, you need to talk to someone and have them start the process of discipling you. These are professional disciplers, the ones that stand up here. These are men and women that are already following God. They've been recognized by the church as following God, and they know how to tell other people how to follow the Lord. Or you say, I already am saved, but I, I just am in a rut. I, I need a tune-up. Do you know what? They would pray. The Lord is the one that tunes. But you need someone to pray with you and say, you need to surrender the Lord, ask him to start and restart and renew and get going, and you need someone to pray with you and encourage you. They're here to do that. So if the Lord has worked in your heart, touched you, stirred you somewhere, don't just go to lunch and forget about it. While you hear his voice, 
respond to him today. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the miracle of salvation. Thank you for turning the world upside down. Actually, you just turn people right side up. That's what salvation does. But to all the lost, it looked like you were tipping everything over. I pray that we would see that miracle active in our lives every day and that church would be the gathering to see who you have saved and changed. And it would be a place where we get encouraged by one another to go back out and to be an edger in your hands and cut through a swath of this world for your glory in the power of your spirit so we can tell people what God is doing with us. Thank you for your great salvation. Bless us as we serve and follow and respond to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray and all God's people said, Amen. God bless you as you go.